thank you very much for inviting me to the conference, and it's a pleasure to be here. The entertainment industry, like so many others, is undergoing enormous changes as a result of globalization and the extraordinary growth of the worldwide middle class. In our industry that has reached in a significant shift in the global box office, until recently, the US generated two thirds of the global box office, while the rest of the world contributed only one third. Today, the reverse is true. Think about it, nearly 70% of the global box office is generated outside of the United States. India has the most admissions in the world. It would be foolish to ignore these numbers. The Hollywood blockbuster Transformers Age of Extinction generated more box office in China than it did in the United States. Life of Pi, which was financed by an American studio made by a Taiwanese director and starred an actor from India, which was also where most of the computer graphics were done, made more money in China than it did in the United States. Likewise, films made outside the US, such as The King's Speech and Pan's Labyrinth, earned more in the US than in the countries where they were made. What that all means is that traditional models for creating, distributing, and monetizing content have changed and will continue to change. US studios are paying more attention to international box office than they used to. In some cases, more attention than they pay to US box office, which obviously makes sense because that's where they earn most of their money internationally. Virtually no big budget movie in Hollywood is approved without considering what its box office potential would be in China. So in a studio green light meeting, one of the key questions before it was released is how will it play in China? Likewise, foreign studios are starting to think about their own export markets. Budgets in developing countries are increasingly, are increasing rapidly, and Hollywood would do well to take note. The impact of globalization on international film markets has also been significant. Never before have there been so much activity in entertainment markets outside of North America, with new film ecosystems emerging. In China, there were 2,000 screens in 2004, and by the end of this year, there will be 20,000 screens. India is the world's largest filmmaking industry by theater admissions and by number of films produced annually. Here in the Middle East, there are a number of established and emerging film ecosystems, such as in the UA UAE, that are becoming a destination for Hollywood and international film markets. In fact, the number of IMAX theaters in the Middle East has gone from, 2000, from, from two in 2001 to 15 today. Based on our activity in the region, we expect this number to double by 2017. We're also seeing increased collaborations among global film markets where countries are pooling financial, creative, and technical resources to create and distribute content. In September, India and China signed a long-planned film co-production co agreement aiming to strengthen ties between their film industries. Also, a growing number of Bollywood films are selecting Dubai as their premier film, uh, filming location. I expect this culture of co collaboration to continue to grow. With international film market growth, we're also seeing more foreign films exported to markets outside of their home territories. Outside of India, Bollywood has many fans in neighboring countries, as you all know well here, and in countries with large Indo-Pakistani communities, including the UK, Australia, and Canada. IMAX's most successful international titles, India's Doom 3, Russia's Stalingrad, and China's The Monkey King, were exported to many other markets and made tremendous box office, primarily in those expat markets. With globalization, I believe this trend will continue, and we should anticipate a rise in foreign film imports. What does all this mean for the future of entertainment around the world? Well, while Hollywood, with its, its established infrastructure, certainly still has an advantage, based on what I've just told you, we, Hollywood really cannot afford to be complacent. Some of the fixed costs and some of the investment in capital equipment, some of the psychology about worldwide distribution may, frankly, be dated and old, old ways of thinking about things. Those who will succeed in the new media world order must understand these broader issues to maintain their leadership position. 
there currently exists an opportunity for regions outside of Hollywood to pick up market share by building the infrastructure, creating the incentives to work in those areas, and perhaps partnering with local entities to create and train talent to populate the integrated workforce that is needed. Over time, because of the shift in the box office and the productions, and the fact that every new movie is essentially a startup, it would be natural to assume that some productions are going to shift, and the regions that learn to leverage this shift will get a bigger piece of the pie. What I mean by every new, uh, every new movie being a new production, you essentially create new sets, you hire new people, you hire new directors, you hire new actors. So it's interesting that historically, a lot was done in Hollywood, but today, especially with digital effects, there's no reason it has to be that way in the future. Additionally, the nature of storytelling must appeal to a worldwide audience, particularly when it comes to blockbuster films. It's no longer enough to insert ethnic actors into big budget movies to appeal to foreign audiences. Studios must truly consider a global audience when making a film. A great example of how all this can work successfully is Transformers, Age of Extinction, which was made by Paramount and directed by Michael Bay. It was shot in Hong Kong and mainland China. Local Chinese actors were cast for the production, and there was even a reality TV show in China where the winners got to appear in the film. In addition, the film's worldwide premiere took place in a special IMAX theater that we built in Hong Kong just for the event. So here's a case where a Hollywood film, from its plot line to who appears in the movie to where it's shot, is truly global in every aspect of its release, and that includes financing. To gain international market share, North American studios must approach each new market differently, partnering and acting locally and being, and being mindful of cultural sensitivities. For the first time in the history of American cinema, Hollywood studios have set up international offices to facilitate local productions filmed in local languages. Legendary Entertainment formed Legendary East, headquartered in Beijing. In India, Disney, Viacom, and Fox have all set up su subsidiaries to create Bollywood content. There's every reason to believe that over time, this trend will continue, and we all need to be prepared. Our global strategy at IMAX is simple. Think and act like a local company, wherever in the world we're doing business. In China, we have 60 employees, and if we have any local issues, we resolve them through our local relationships, not through bilateral relationships. We built a business model that's a win-win for all involved there, and today China is our second largest market outside the U.S., and in three years it'll be our largest market in the world. We've essentially grown up with the Chinese film industry and the Chinese consumer and think that's going to happen in the rest of the world, including in this region. We now have 880 IMAX theaters across 60 countries. We tailor our programming to specific regions or countries through a combination of Hollywood and local language films in markets like France, India, Russia, and China. Since 2010, we've presented 23 local language films in IMAX to strong success. The Russian film Stalingrad was the most successful film in the history of Russian cinema, and IMAX generated 13% of the film's total box office on only 39 IMAX screens. The IMAX per screen average for our first ever Bollywood title, Doom 3, was four times that of regular multiplexes in India. We're also participating in the release of four of the top five highest grossing films in the history of China. Our global approach to programming, combined with our network growth, has resulted in our international box office surpassing our domestic box office in almost every quarter since 2013. There's no reason to believe this trend will change as we continue to expand our network globally. Within the context of all I've just discussed, an interesting question is, will this change caused by globalization affect the soft power traditionally wielded by Hollywood, using mo movies as a cultural influence to export the American dream worldwide? The U.S. film industry has been the largest and most important exporter of Western values and American influence. But with the rise of international film markets, other voices want to be heard on the global entertainment platform. Last year, the Dalian Wanda Group 
broke ground on a multi-billion dollar movie production complex in Qingdao as part of a plan to recreate Hollywood in China. Fosun, a Chinese company, invested $200 million into a company called Studio, Studio 8, run by Jeff Robinoff, who used to be a very senior person at Warner Brothers. SoftBank invested $250 million in legendary studios. While all of this will create competition for Hollywood, it will also force it to challenge the status quo and enhance its own understanding and ability to make better films for wider audiences. I believe that the most successful studios will be those that can incorporate their home country's values and cultural identity while adding subtle nuances to, a, to appeal to broader markets. It's also interesting to note that in a sense, globalization creates a democratization of the filmmaking process. When you look at a film production, as I said before, every new movie is a startup regardless of where it's located in the world. It has a new director, a new cast, except for sequels, of course, which they make money by leveraging off the old cast, new sound stages, a new director of photography, etc. The traditional economic and technological barriers related to how, who, and where content is created are weakening. I believe the talents and film successes of the future will be found in new places and in new and exciting ways. Not only are international film studios responding to globalization, but governments worldwide are also seeing the benefits of a strong entertainment ecosystem in their respective countries. Here are some key initiatives the Middle East is following and should continue to implement to foster its own ecosystem. Number one, offer incentives to attract global film productions. This has both direct benefits such as the impact on GDP and rise in employment and indirect benefits such as growth in tourism, technology, and, and knowledge transfer. In Canada, many U.S. productions are enticed by the country's lower exchange rate, lucrative tax credits, and skilled workforce. Mission Impossible 5, the sequels to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, The Avengers, and the next Star Wars ins installment are all currently sh shooting in the U.K. thanks to a competitive tax credit. The Abu, da the Abu Dhabi Film Commission announced a 30% rebate for production shooting in the city in 2012. Since then, there's been an increase in film productions with high profile movies such as Fast and Furious 7, which is coming out next April, including an IMAX, and Star Wars, which recently completed shooting in the city. And by the way, the segment of Star Wars that was shot here in Abu Dhabi was shot with IMAX cameras and is one of the set pieces of the film. Two, build the infrastructure needed create the opportunities for people to enter the industry and perhaps partner with universities to train the talent and create an integrated local f workforce. For example, he here in Abu Dhabi, the fact that NYU with its world-renowned film school is here certainly gives you a leg up in creating the infrastructure through education. I believe international markets will have a bigger piece of the pie and reap the many benefits that come with a robust film market. Three. Create an industry cluster that can collectively lobby and shape the entertainment landscape, making the Middle East a can't-miss destination for other media hubs located throughout the world. As a final observation, we can't have a conversation about global shifts without mentioning the impact of digital advance and on how content is created and how content is consumed. With more devices and better in-home entertainment experiences, out-of-home ex entertainment will need to evolve. There's a tremendous sense of responsibility among film executives worldwide to improve the movie-going experience in the future. The theater is where the filmmakers want their movies to be seen first, in a comfortable environment with the latest image and sound technology. I believe consumers still want to have a, a social experience and see movies in a group, but that experience must be superior to what they can get in their homes. That's one reason we believe IMAX has been so popular, particularly on a global scale. Um, just this weekend, Inter well, two weekends ago, Interstellar opened, and in the first nine days, IMAX did $50 million. In the United States, we did 25% of the whole box office on 350 screens out of over 8,000 screens where the movie was released. 
We did 20% of the box office in China. And here in the Middle East, the second weekend did 10% more than the first weekend did. And, and by the way, our theaters in the Middle East are among the highest grossing in the world. Our immersive cinematic, cinematic experience offers consumers something that can't be replicated in the home. So as long as filmmakers produce compelling stories that connect with audiences while pushing the boundaries of technology to enhance storytelling, we should be in great shape. I don't think anyone could predict how this all plays out at the end of the day, but there is no question in my mind that globalization will continue to have a major impact on the way people consume entertainment, the nature of storytelling, where content is created, and where future audiences will emerge. As this unfolds over the next five to 10 years, we'll have an opportunity to assess who are the winners in this new reality and who are the losers. I'm optimistic that for worldwide consumers, it's all going to lead to better forms of entertainment, uh, particularly those that are more culturally attuned to the markets that they're showing in as the global marketplace continues to evolve. Um, thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. So um, I agree that uh, technology evolution in the homes with bigger screen, better quality, and uh, can be matched in the theater by having uh, similar technology, better quality picture and sounds. But we see also the regular cinemas also improve in new, in new technologies like 3Ds and 4D, 4Ds with a lot of uh, effects. So that will be some sort of competition to the IMAX. But I tend to agree. I mean, I've been. Uh, uh, frequent goer to the IMAX and it's fantastic experience. But if we look at not from the technology and the quality of the picture aspect, but more from the time that consumer uh, spend time watching television or watching consume media, we've seen in the last five years phenomenal growth of an excitement happening in the series, in the TV series. I mean, uh, never before people get so hooked up into series as they are in the last few years. And now we're also seeing producer of very famous movies going to the TV series. And, you know, uh, there are so many examples related to that. Do you see the excitement happening in the TV series kind of compete with the movies industry? Or you try to take advantage of that somehow by bringing it to the cinemas and the IMAX uh, theaters? Um, I, I think a little bit of both. I think that um, you still look at the top directors in the world that want the top budgets, and you know the budget for Interstellar was about 180 million dollars. So you you obviously can't make an ongoing series with that kind of budget. So I still think that the top level director talent is going to be migrated to those kind of budgets, and there's no way the model works to do that in TV. On the other hand, I think your second observation is definitely right. Um, TV makes way more money um, than movies for studios, and I think episodic um, TV is something that will be, will eventually show up in theaters. Um, they opened uh, Game of Thrones was open at a big basketball arena in Brooklyn, at Brooklyn, New York, and 19,000 people came out to see it. So I think the lines are going to start to blur, and I think they're go, you know the the best content that's pr uh, produced for television will start to show up in different forms in in theaters. And I also think studios will change their philosophy over time. So you look at the sequel, in a way a sequel is like a series over, if it's Harry Potter, it's over five years or six years. But I do think that model is consistent with consumer tastes and will be increasingly adopted in the movie industry. Are there any other, I see a hand in the back. Do I see a hand in the back there or not? It may be an illusion. <laughs> Come on, guys. IMAX is a really interesting business. Technology, laser, global. 
There's got to be some questions. I didn't answer everything. I'm sure of that. Back there. I wanted to ask you a question about, uh, first of all, thanks for your presentation. It was very illuminating. <clears throat> and I was very interested to listen to you talk about uh, sort of the recipe for success to build out an industry. And this is where my question lies. Uh, I'm Canadian. I spent my last five years living in Canada in Vancouver. And something I be became very aware of was that film in the end is a very soft industry. So when the Canadian dollar was at 70 American cents, you couldn't walk down a Vancouver street without seeing some American production. And then it went to 85 cents, and they had to offset that with tax breaks. Then it went to 90 cents, and they couldn't offset it with tax breaks. And suddenly, Mexico became the new home for all this stuff that was being shot in Vancouver. So how does one uh, prevent this type of soft movement from happening? See, I think the answer to that has a lot to do um, with technology. So I think the fixed overhead of uh, making a big movie in these productions is such that if you're a technology leader, um, you can overcome that. So, for example, making an animated movie in, uh, through the studio structure in uh, Los Angeles costs multiples of what it would cost to make it in, in China or India or outsource a lot of that. And I think... Um, especially special effects. You look at the big blockbuster movies and the dependence on those movies on special effects, and particularly developing countries with lower labor rates, um, you can really compete over the longer term doing that. Um, I think um, Hollywood needs, as I was talking about in the prepared remarks, Hollywood needs to be rethought in certain ways but because I think uh, the pay scales and the infrastructure, while on the surface it provides a competitive advantage deeper than the surface, I think it also provides a little bit of, a, of an anchor to the bottom. So I, I do think there's an opportunity, although obviously the short-term swings and the value of currencies you know, does affect short-term behavior. But I think when you look at over time, um, the combination of technology and infrastructure. And another thing I touched on in my comments is the ed building the whole ecosystem. So um, um, using film schools, creating the technical skills to go along. I think what happened in Canada with the currency was they were sort of just renting out studios. They really didn't take a holistic approach to it. And if you're just renting out real estate, then you're going to be subject to the short-term swings in the currency rather than if you're really providing a value-added proposition. Right over here. Great presentation. I really appreciate uh, hearing your whole vision about uh, the uh, sector. Two questions for you. One regarding the technology, what's coming up. Uh, uh, from your end of the business, and a second question regarding um, the room that you have for independent cinema. You talked about blockbusters and how globally things are changing, and where you have new market players that are coming in. But a lot of those market players are, are really still at uh, more of uh, an independent cinema type of approach. So, uh, what is IMAX's take on that? So, first on technology, um, we've always tried to. Um, it, innovate and reinvent ourselves. So we actually became digital before the mainstream industry became digital because it was cost prohibitive. For us, one IMAX print of one movie um, cost $30,000. Now that we're digital, it costs $150. So we beat those costs out before someone else beat us to it. So our, our latest innovation, it's called um, laser projection. So any projector that you've seen is based on something called a xenon lamp, and it's an electric bulb. But with an electric bulb, if it gets too bright, um, it, it blows up. So you can't create large enough images or bright enough images. So over the last three years, we acquired patents, and we invested about $50 million, and we invented a new system that works on laser technology, and it's, it's way brighter than anything you've seen today. It's way, um, the blacks are blacker, which is a big deal. Um, the colors are much better colors, and you can do much bigger screens. So what you used to think was a big IMAX screen is going to be a small IMAX screen 
someday because of that technology. And it, it's not incremental, it's really revolutionary. I think um, we're opening um, the first one in the region in the Mall of Qatar in 2016, so you'll be able to see it. it it's just, it's, it's a revolutionary change that'll look great. We've also tried to really enhance the sound system because sound is such a big part of the movie going experience and we're introducing a next generation technology. We've been very involved in image capture, so uh, Michael Bay shot a significant part of Transformers using a new digital camera that we just invented. So we're always trying to think of, particularly in light of what uh, this gentleman was talking about before, in the home and the innovations and consumers wanting to sit on the couch. So you can't just be complacent and pretend that what you're doing today is gonna be good enough 10 years from now. You have to keep going forward, which, which we're very much trying to do. In terms of the role of the independents, in, in a way, I think it could be the golden age for independents, but they may have to rethink their business model a little bit because the cost of distribution is so high and the, the, the in-home changes are so, um, so massive that if you think of independence the way you used to think about them, you know, you put up the money, you finance the movie, you go to festivals, you try and sell your movie, you know, you try and get theaters to take it, um, you know, that model may, may be obsoleted. But on the other hand, um, it's so cheap to distribute now and you don't need a studio to distribute. You can self-distribute or you could distribute through Netflix or, you know, another service like that. The, and the costs of production have been wrung out because you can shoot it with your iPhone if you want. You don't need big production studios or special cameras to do it. So I, I think it's going to really thrive, but I think the distribution patterns will change and maybe more of it will go to the home away from the theater and more of it will go to mobile devices. But I think more independent filmmakers will be able to have their story told and get it out there. And I think given also the viral nature of the world today, if you get it out there, um, you know, people, word of mouth spreading so quickly, I think there's uh, even a higher po probability of success. So no one went into the independent movie business to get rich, a few people it happened to. But if you go in it to make a statement and show your vision, I think this might be one of the best times in history to do that. Are there any other questions? Oh, one back there. Hi. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. We'll get you next. Hey. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, amazing. I have two questions. The first one was, um, what's your favorite movie for 2014? And the second question <laughs> is, um, my friends and I always go back and forth and debate that there's been a huge increase in superhero movies. Avengers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Spider-Man 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Transformers up to 4. Uh, is this increase in superhero movies uh, a clear lack of innovation, or is it just people really like them, so let's just keep making them? So what's the reason behind all these new super, superhero movies? So my favorite movie, and I hope you get to see it, especially in IMAX, is Interstellar. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's just incredible. It's, it's, you know, it's very, um, it, if, you, if you saw, I don't know if you saw Inception, the Chris Nolan movie, but it has those elements to it. It's, it, it's, it's quite uh, intellectually stimulating, but more importantly, visually and sound, um, it, it's amazing. It, it, it's something you really need to see if you haven't seen it. In terms of the superhero movies, um, I think the reason for those is because um, there are no brands in the movie industry, so you have to think about it. Like, nobody goes to a Sony movie because it's Sony. Right? They, don't, they don't wake up one morning and go, oh, Fox, I got to go to a Fox movie. But I think the brands become, like you said, uh, Spider-Man's a brand, Harry Potter's a brand, and you brought in the audiences. So I think that's kind of the intellectual reason for it, because you've established a brand, you build off it. An economic reason is you have the sets, you have, you know, you could kind of formulaic make more money. Um, another reason is I think that... Um, most people in Hollywood tend to be risk averse. So if you're the executive that greenlit, um, you know, Hunger Games 3, which opens today, and it doesn't work, you can say, you know, what do you want from me? It was Hunger Games 3, it couldn't fail. On the other hand, if you're the ones who said, you know, the hungry game, which you dreamed out of your head and it fails, your boss is gonna go to you, you know, what kind of idiot would come up with a stupid mo movie like the hungry game? So I think one of the reasons 
besides the other more legitimate reasons, is that, you know, it's just people are not incented to take risk. They're incented to uh, make money following the status quo. There was a question back there. Hi, Brian Gruber, and uh, any uh, anecdote that includes Brooklyn in it is always a great anecdote, isn't it? Um, I wonder about your thoughts as to where day and date might be going with uh, theatrical and television, and whether you see that uh, exclusively as a threat for your business, or because you offer such an exclusive and superior experience that people can never have in the home, that that might help to differentiate you further. Um, that's a really good question and a very complicated one. Um, I think there's no question that um, different organizations from Netflix, um, which has already announced four Adam Sandler movies and two other full-length movies that um, are going to go direct to Netflix rather than to theaters, um, to the agendas of some of the studios on a worldwide basis um, where they want to distribute content and cut out the, you know, the middleman, I think there's no question that there's going to be a, an attack on Windows. What I personally think is going to happen is that for the blockbuster movies, the Windows are going to hold for a longer time than we think. And I think the reason for that is um, you can make money over multiple platforms and you can market. You use essentially the theatrical release as a full-length trailer for the releases that follow and you can monetize various windows. So I think there's going to be a lot of talk about it, but I think for the bigger budget movies, it's going to take much longer than people think. And, um, you know, and I think for the other movies, um, the assault is going to happen soon. And I don't know, we'll see. Um, so from IMAX's point of view, I don't know either, you know, we'll see. So um, we announced an experiment uh, with Netflix. Netflix is making the sequel to uh, Crouching Tiger. Um, the, um, the first one, um, was made by one of the studios and sold the rights to Netflix. So this is happening next August and it's going directly to the home. And we thought we would do a little bit of an experiment and we would distribute it in IMAX theatrically and charge people our regular ticket prices to do it. And our thought process was if people want to see it on any device, you know, we're just a different device and we'll see. Um, there's been some resistance in our industry, even to the test, and you know, we made it clear um, that that's all it was. But um, if you ask me the question next late August, I think I'll have an answer. I'm not, I really don't know um, what consumer behavior will be at that time. I th um, I'm getting waved. That means stop. Okay. I'm sorry I don't speak that language so well. But anyway, thank you very much. It was my pleasure to come here. Thank you. Thank you, Gelford, for your interesting topics that you shared with us.